Welcome to CSIS Online. The way we bring you events is changing, but we'll still present live analysis and award-winning digital media from our Dracopolis Ideas Lab. All on your time, live or on demand. This is CSIS Online. Good afternoon. I'm Jay Kurtzer, Director and Senior Fellow of the Humanitarian Agenda at the Center for Strategic and International Studies. On behalf of CSAS, welcome and thank you for joining us today. I'd like to remind everyone that you can submit questions for panelists through the event registration page and that the event today will be posted online in its entirety about 24 hours after we finish. Today's event is focused on improving civilian protection in armed conflict. We're at a unique moment. We're in the midst of a political transition with the Biden administration staffing up and establishing policies on in incredibly important issues. We're also witnessing an increased public attention on the authorization for the use of military force, both as an effort by Congress to reassert its prerogatives and war powers, and also as part of a narrative shift in the United States about a shift from a counterterrorism focused lens towards our foreign policy and national security, and one that sees competition with China and Russia as a paramount strategic objective. We're also 20 years from the attacks of September 11th and thinking about the, the efforts and the ways that those counterterrorism operations have been carried out. Throughout the past two decades, the United States has invested some time and effort towards minimizing civilian harm in military operations, but we still face significant challenges in improving civilian protection from minimizing casualties to measuring the impact of our military operations, to providing compensation for those casualties when they take place. And so we're very grateful today to be joined by Sarah Holowinski and Larry Lewis to help us think through some of these questions with a focus on how we can improve this policy. Sarah Holowinski is the Washington Director of Human Rights Watch and brings extensive experience leading global efforts to improve civilian protection. For nearly a decade, she was the Executive Director of the Center for Civilians in Conflict and was recognized as one of the top 100 most influential people in armed violence reduction by action on armed violence. Larry Lewis, the vice, the director of the Center for Autonomy and Artificial Intelligence at the Center for Naval Analysis also has extensive experience in reducing civilian casualties, security systems, counterterrorism, and identifying lessons learned from current operations. Larry has spent the past decade analyzing real world operations for DOD's joint lessons learned studies, was a lead analyst and author for the joint civilian casualty study, and authored lessons from a decade of war for the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff. Welcome to Sarah and Larry. We're grateful to have you here today. As we had discussed, today's event is one where you both approach this from an area of experience within government and from outside and are thinking about questions of policy and also as well from the analytic side of this, of this issue. You've both looked closely at the evidence. And so you come today, I think, from a place of interest and experience. And today is an opportunity to reflect on your experience and help our colleagues in the viewing audience understand what you've seen so we can all work together towards a better future. Um, so I'd like to start by saying, by putting a question to you, um, Sarah and Larry, what hasn't happened over the past two decades when we think about civilian protection and armed conflict and why? So Sarah, maybe we can start with you. Oh, good, because I was gonna cut Larry off if he started before me. Um, <laughs> I really, I've been wanting to answer this question. And this is, um, if you've seen the Just Security piece that I put out and then Larry followed with, with a great um, in-depth piece after that. It, this is a question that has been haunting me because, you know, Larry and I, we were on the outside, we were part of civil society, we were also part of the US government under Obama and under President Trump, and we've been working on these issues for such an extraordinarily long time, um, about 15 years now. And so when I think about, you know, what have we accomplished, even just from a personal standpoint, I want to know that things have changed and what is disappointing to me, I mean, I think Larry comes from a more hopeful standpoint, so hopefully he can lift everyone's spirits after I speak. But, um, you know, from my standpoint, if I think about when I got started in this work in 2005, um, what a civilian who experienced harm from the United States would have experienced and would have experienced afterwards and I think about that same thing now, I'm not entirely sure that a lot has changed 
Um, I think they, they, you know, their names would still not be necessarily be listed anywhere um, for the U.S. government. They wouldn't receive compensation, most likely. Um, the the airstrike or munitions that hit them, you know, I think it is a slim chance that the procedures that were used um, were, have improved very much in the past 15 years. And, you know, there is still nobody within the Department of Defense that is specifically looking at civilian protection across the board and analyzing trends and looking at the data and making sure that lessons are learned and improving things. So that is my incredibly bleak um, outlook on this issue. And yet, as I think Larry will tell you, it is so easy to fix. So L Larry, go ahead, make everyone feel a little better. Well, I don't know if it'll make people feel better because in some ways it's, it's more depressing um, because I think in the last 20 years, I mean, this, this is a great time to reflect, right? 20 years after 9-11, we've been working on uh, you know, lots of different challenges, including the civilian protection challenge for 20 years. And we can look back and what has gone well and what has not gone well. And I think one thing we can really be pleased about is the potential that we've seen because we've had these moments in the last 20 years that have shown just incredible insights into how we can better protect civilians. We've had operational uh, experiences that have shown this can be, this is true, okay? So, and it's not just about international law, it's also about policy and about military practice and how when they're combined together in the right way and you frame the problem in, in, in the right way, we can do, really amazing things. Um, but the, the sad thing to me is that this is, this is a lesson that we haven't learned and it just slips through our fingers. And so what we, what we end up happening is we have these moments that are really promising, but then we kind of slip back into you know, not, not doing what we could. So maybe I can ask you and just stay with you, Larry, what are some of those promising moments? And I think you both were, were part of them. So what were, what were some of the, I don't think high points is the right word here, but what were the promising moments um, in terms of mitigation or analysis um, that we can look at and like you say, learn the lessons from that moment and try to take forward. And if you can also speak to them, what caused the regression from those, those moments of improved policy and practice? Sure, so I'll try to be brief because I could talk for hours just on the, the, the best practices that were developed. But I think overall, there have been a few kind of aha moments. The, the first is that uh, protecting civilians is not just about the law. So, you know, we need lawyers at the table because international humanitarian law or the law of armed conflict, I mean, that's the floor, that's the foundation, but there is so much more that can also be done. And there, and there are very you know, practical elements, both of policy and practice, you know, the involvement of guidance, the, the, the importance of how we plan an operation, um, and then the, the assessment piece. Uh, so so that, is kind of, that has been a lesson that we've learned over the last 20 years, that I think the, the US has, has, has seen this, right? And the international community hasn't quite grasped it yet. So if you look at the, you know, the annual UN um, reports on protection of civilians, it largely still focuses on IHL compliance. You look at other countries, and we can kind of talk about, you know, the US has an example for leadership, opportunity for leadership. You know, a, a lot of these partners are still think, looking through the legal lens, but one of the biggest lessons I think is that there are so many more things you can do besides compliance. And it, the, the, the problem has been, this has been driven, this problem has been driven operationally. And so there's pressure on operational forces to solve it as they're doing an operation. And in some cases they've done tremendous jobs. I mean, really exemplary jobs. The, the problem is that those, those lessons indicated have not fed back into the institution the, the way that they should. And so you get kind of a short-term you know, memory uh, loss and, and then we kind of start all over again. 
Yeah, Jake, I'll I'll just feed into that. I mean, one of the big frustrations is that the lessons that we learn aren't institutionalized. So they, they seem to sort of come and then they go. And it's not something that is consistently prioritized within the US military apparatus or within the US government. So, you know, we have a government now that is um, basically designed around counterterrorism. Um, everything within the US government is designed around counterterrorism. And yet civilian protection, the things that we have learned um, through counterterrorism operations have not been embedded within that system. So, you know, Larry and I um, were in Afghanistan a long time ago, 10 years ago, and then, and then for years thereafter. And I, that's a really good example that we are always talking about in that General McChrystal saw that there was a problem with civilian casualties. The headlines were everywhere. The Afghan people were very upset. You know, the President Karzai was saying, we're gonna kick the US out unless you stop causing civilian casualties. And all of that pressure created new standard operating procedures, a tactical directive that said, you are not going to fire unless you are being fired upon. And basically, I mean, civilian casualties went down dramatically. And we've seen that every time a commander puts his or her focus on civilian casualties. But that does nothing to change the institution of the US military. It does nothing to change the planning for the next conflict that we're going to get into. And so what you get next time is, you know, fingers crossed that that next commander is going to look at civilian casualties or have enough of a problem that they will then need to improve operations. And so what we're saying is, Let's fix this. Let's fix this once and for all. There are operational things we can do. There are tactical things that you can know about and then implement. And in terms of strategy, you know, if you're looking at an operational plan to go into China or Korea or wherever in the future, make sure you have incorporated everything that we've learned. Thanks. You know, in a, in a previous professional iteration, I spent a lot of time listening to and and learning from JAGs and other folks who, and there was a, a constant refrain of the US military is one of the best learning institutions. Um, and so what you're saying doesn't really jive with that because you're saying there were moments of learning, of lessons learned and lessons applied, and then they, they faded away. And, and that's disheartening, especially given the, the subject matter. And so Sarah, you touched on something in your first comment, um, which I wanna come back to about someone in charge, right? An individual um, tasked with civilian protection. Thinking about the US government, you know, who should that be and where should they sit and why? Is this someone in, in DOD or is this someone who has to sit outside of it? You know, what are, what are some ways we can think about that position for maximum impact in, in achieving the outcomes we want? Yeah, um, I've thought about this a little bit. And I think, you know, there, there are a lot of different ways to do this. And in the past, um, there is an office within the Pentagon who has the remit for thinking about civilian protection, um, but they're not at a high enough level to actually change the whole institution. I went into the joint staff and was a senior advisor to the chairman of the joint staff um, on human rights and civilian protection. Once I left, the joint staff still doesn't have anyone that is focused on that and who is reporting to the highest levels. Congress um, required that there be a senior position that was focused on civilian casualties as part of his or her portfolio. The problem is it has always been given to somebody who doesn't actually have a background in civilian protection. And you know, Larry can tell you that looking at having focused on this issue as a scientist for the past decade, you need to understand the nitty gritty of what this looks like on the ground. You need to understand what, you know, rates and risk and data and analysis can do. You need to understand how the US military actually operates and what tactical directives and standard operating procedures can do. So the point being, we need somebody senior within the Pentagon both on the OSD side, that's Office of Secretary of Defense, and on the Joint Staff side, who knows what they're talking about and who has some expertise in this issue. And then, um, you know, I, I think basically we advocate with them, they go out and see what's happening, they understand how to get into the planning process. 
That's what we need. And the problem is the Pentagon right now is thinking about how to reduce the number of assistant secretaries for defense. So, you know, is this issue going to get prioritized? I suspect not. Larry, do you want to add anything? Yeah, yes, please. So, so, so two things. Uh, first of all, you know, your, your previous um, belief that the U.S. is a strong learning institution, uh, I'd refer you to, to Theo uh, Farrell. Uh, he's done extensive work on military learning and adaptation and innovation. Uh, and one thing he, he notes uh, both about the U.K. and the U.S. is that they are very strong adapting institutions in war. Right, and you look look at the history of, of U.S. operations over the last hundred years. You see that, right? We're really good at adapting things on the fly to 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 succeed. There's a flip side to that, right? Because we're so good at that, it actually can undermine the institutional learning piece. Because it's like it doesn't really matter. Because when it counts, we'll we'll be able to figure it out. So, um, so I think what we're saying is not is not uh, contradictory to to kind of looking at history. Um, on on Sarah's point, I mean, I definitely agree. We need leadership, and we need informed leadership. So, um, you know, I've seen over and over, you know, people. That that think they understand this, uh, and and I you know kind of want to uh, quote um, um, uh, Luke Skywalker from the Last Jedi. You know, it's like every word you said is wrong, um, in a, in a more polite way. Um, but there are many misunderstandings about civilian harm. People think that they understand it, but they often don't. Um, we even saw. You know, so in, in Afghanistan, General McNeil, he cared about civilian harm, but he misunderstood how it happened. And so the guidance that he put in place didn't fix the problem. And then General McKiernan, he cared about civilian harm, but again, he didn't understand it. And so you have to combine both the, the, the will, the intent to fix things with the, the knowledge and the expertise and what the problem actually is. And that's what worries me about the new administration. You know, the, the new administration, I think there's a lot of willingness to address these problems, but willingness is not sufficient. We, we've, we've, you know, Sarah's paper talks about a number of different problems in civilian protection over the years. Many of those originated in, in the Obama administration. President Obama cared about this issue deeply Right, they like look at counterterrorism. They, you know, there was a really strong policy on counterterrorism op operations. The fact is, though, they didn't follow that with assessments to see if it actually worked. Uh, and so, you know, so it's not enough to be the good guys. You know, we also have to do the work and make sure we're solving the right problems. You know, you mentioned um, Luke Skywalker, and you know, this has stuck with me for so long. There's a scene in the movie Clerks where these two New Jersey clerks have a really meaningful argument about the contractors on the Death Star. And was it appropriate for them to blow it up because they were innocent bystanders? And I raise it because this issue, I think for many people is either a question of military tactics or for lawyers to discuss. But that movie kind of indicated to me that actually people think about these questions in various different forms and it's actually relevant in in, in a lot of different ways. So thank you for bringing Luke into the conversation. Now we have a question, um, I, I read it as somewhat skeptical, but the question suggests, you know, should the United States government be providing lawyers for civilians in combat zones? Uh, and Larry, you've written and you've done the analysis on civilian harm. And so, and I think we have that capacity within our government to do these kinds of investigations. So can you talk me through a little bit how these investigations have happened, should happen, and what happens when there is an investigation? And as one last auxiliary question for you and Sarah, um, what is the role for non-governmental organizations in this official responsibility of the US government as a matter of law? So it's complicated. Um, and, and even over the last 10 years, we've seen a lot of change in, in the, uh, in the, uh, the you, you can talk about um, 
investigations, but we're actually talking about different processes. Um, so there's investigations, command-directed investigations. Those were used in Afghanistan and, and elsewhere, uh, both for learning, but also for accountability. Those are really intensive um, things to do. And so, uh, you know, McChrystal and others, they said, we're gonna do a command-directed investigation for every civilian casualty um, allegation. Um, you know, it, it's a really useful thing for learning, but it is really time intensive. And it also has some connotations of, of presumption of guilt um, that are not necessarily helpful. So, you know, over, over time, we've sort of, we've kind of been saying, you know, we need something else to, to use this to both assess the, you know, the credibility of a, of a potential incident, but also to learn. I think we've kind of moved in that direction in the first piece, the assessment piece, but not the second. So now we have something called CCARS, Civilian Casualty um, Assessment Report. Um, and they, they are focused entirely on this question of, okay, did they happen or not? Um, and they're, they're definitely not perfect. And I could go on and on about the problems that they have. Um, but they're, they're also, that leaves another piece, which is they're not sufficient for learning. Right, they're really only laser focused on this assessment question. So we we have an assessment gap. Um, the, the the second part of your question is what is the role of NGOs? Um, there is a common assumption I think within the military um, that you know, when when the military causes civilian harm, they know it. Um, but that's not what the data says. So, so you know, having done you know assessments for DoD, uh, like in, in Iraq and Syria, we found that 58% of civilian harm that was ultimately um, acknowledged by the U.S. government um, didn't come from a U.S. military report. It came from an NGO or someone else coming forward with with potential information that turned out to be true. So there is definitely a role, even in that kind of response piece for NGOs. Uh, and we can also talk in depth about you know, kind of the front, front piece as well. Which I think is what the US military needs to recognize is that you know NGOs are not force multipliers as, as Colin Powell once said, rather they are sources of information when and if they want to be, which of course has to be respected. But one thing that the US military has, has not really taken on board as much as it should is that it needs to be going out and getting that sort of third party information. It can be looking at social media, it can be talking with journalists, it can be doing witness interviews itself, but if it cannot for some reason, then there are NGOs that are talking with these victims and, and the military should be getting that information. So we have a couple questions here again that I wanna to try to combine in, into one. And they were, they, they're both thinking about other actors and in the counterterrorism environment, um, there's this, uh, you know, the by, with and through, we have a lot of partners that the United States has either trained, equipped, or worked, or, or fought side by side with. And so, you know, one of the question I think is how, you know, what the responsibility is and how we, how much we should be doing or aren't doing with respect to partner operations. And the second question is, and, and Larry, in your piece, you talked about and multiple times, I think you mentioned that the United States even with all its flaws remains one of the best militaries in the world in terms of these issues. But how do we see these questions at NATO or with NATO allies being addressed? And is there anything we should be learning? You know, so we have the partner side, what should we do with them? And we have the, can we learn from peers question? Um, what, are, what are NATO allies doing or you know, um, in, in European or, or other countries that seem to have integrated some of these um, questions into their doctrine and practice. So I'll take I'll take a, a piece of the partner side, which is that you know President Biden came in and said human rights is going to be central to our foreign policy, and for the most part he has lived up to that so far. I mean so you know we're a couple months in, but we're seeing quite a lot of that, um, including calling out both allies and adversaries on human rights abuses. Well, that has to translate to our partners in, in these military efforts too. And at one point in the counterterrorism fight against ISIS, um, there were something like 73 counterterrorism partners. That is huge. And that partnership includes um, 
it, it includes training, it includes weapons, so equipping, it includes assisting, sometimes it includes, you know, basically fighting shoulder to shoulder, as they would say, against terrorist groups. So all of that means that not only does the U.S. need to be really responsible in who it gives those training and equipping and assisting um, benefits to, but it also has to show through its own example um, how to do these how to do these things. And by these things, I mean having a proper collateral damage estimate, which often they do, means having um, battle damage assessments that include civilian harm. It means conducting investigations in the way that Larry is saying. It means planning for your operation in a way that includes the civilian population on every single page of that planning document. So all of these things um, are, is the US leading by example, which is exactly what President Biden said the United States should be doing. So, so, so how do we do that in practice, right? How do we lead by example? And I think, you know, for, for, for two components, one is kind of the responsible arms sales and security cooperation thing. Um, so I think there's a lot of attention on, we need more conditionality. And I, I, you know, I agree, right? More conditionality, civilian harm, human rights. But I think we can also flip this around and say, look, this, is, this should not just be a condition. This should be a goal. This is something that we can actually try to improve and not just say, oh, you know, they went below the threshold and so we're going to stop it, right? But we can, we can actually work with our partners to try to make them better at these things. Uh, and we've had a few cases where we, we you know, this, this is actually something, uh, it's not easy, but it's something we can do. But if we don't make it a goal, then we're not even going to try. And then coalition partners are really struggling with this. Right. So this is another opportunity for U.S. leadership, even though even though, you know, we're definitely you know, we, we have trouble learning. Right. But but the lessons are there. So I, you know, I just published another paper on uh, New Zealand uh, yesterday. So that's one example uh, on a case where New Zealand is really struggling. Right. And they tried their they tried their best, but they just didn't know what they didn't know. Uh, and so what they ended up doing is suboptimal. Uh, the, the Netherlands. They had, you know, they are struggling right now. They're wrestling, I should say, wrestling with what to do after the the uh, the incident in Mosul. Um, the French just had their wedding strike, right? And what do they do? They deny it. Um, and you know, I don't know the facts, right? But I'll tell you, I've seen I've seen a number of wedding party strikes and other strikes where the U.S. military has has misidentified non-combatants as what they believe to be lawful targets. And they then they go through this predictable pattern of denying things without really looking objectively, right? That it's hard to, to cross that cognitive bias that they tend to have. And then NATO, NATO has a POC policy, which everyone says is great, but I think there, I already see three strikes against their, their policy. First is, okay, how about acknowledging civilian harm? Uh, from Libya 10 years ago, you know, that would, you know, and then, um, and then Afghanistan. So there's a NATO, there's one NATO operation going on, and that's in Afghanistan, resolute support, civilian harm rates have been going through the roof in the last few years. How does that jive with the NATO POC policy? And then of course, you know, NATO POC policy is predicated on what the partners are going to do. And, you know, we look at the French, we look at, again, I guess Netherlands are they're they're a partner, right? But um, so I think there's a lot of room for leadership here uh, that you know, the world is waiting for. And Jake, I'm sure you have a question on the tip of your tongue. I just want to say really briefly for those who have not followed this issue really closely, we are talking about very practical solutions. So what Larry was just talking about, don't knee jerk deny that you have caused civilian harm that make sure that your public affairs office does not put out a statement that says we absolutely did not cause this because you know that in a week you're gonna have to go back and say, well, there were some mitigating circumstances. Just don't do it, just have a guideline that says we are going to acknowledge that this strike happened and we're gonna look into it. Make sure that you are collecting as much data as possible and tracking it over time. It's remarkable to me and this, I don't want our US military friends to get 
to get defensive about this. What we are saying is that you have learned a lot of lessons. We were part of this institution. We are frustrated with ourselves for, for this not getting done, but look at data over time and see if the rates are going up or down and see if you can correlate with what was happening in the operation. And if you can if you can fix some of that. So those are the types of things that we're talking about where you could actually just make a list of, you know, boom, 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 boom. Here are particular solutions to these problems. And if you were to institutionalize these, then in the next operation, you wouldn't see the same problems. And that's why we think that this is easy and why we are frustrated that it's not been fixed. Thanks. Um, the, the passion and experience comes through. Um, I want I want to ask I want to turn shortly to um, thinking about the future um, in terms of the way that military planners and analysts think that that we're headed. But there are a couple of questions. I want to just come back to this either the role of NGOs and how they sit next to it. And there's another set of questions here about you know are there are there tech solutions. Are there things that we can, are there tools available now that might not have been available in the past? Um, or is this really a policy question and, and tech is a tool, but it requires, it requires the, the motivation and the commitment to use it? Can I take that one, Sarah? Okay, so um, so I'd say one, one thing we've been working on over a period of time is this, there's, there is no one solution, right? So it's not, it's not just we need a new policy and that'll solve it, or there's not a new technology that we need. That we what we need is a comprehensive solution. So there's really so much that can be done. Um, you know, not just like at this tactical moment of engagement, uh, but from the very beginning. You know, as we develop our mandate, as we develop the capabilities we need, all the way to how do we plan and the tools and the information that we have available to do that, and then tactical execution, and then we don't stop there, right? So then we have to figure out what actually happened versus what we think happened, and then there's kind of this learning process, and then that should be a learning loop. So we're doing this over and over and getting better and better over time. Do you want us to, so you didn't, do you want to address the tech solutions? Are there, I mean, you're the AI guy. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, so yes, <laughs> bottom line, yes, there is a lot that we can do. The U S has developed a lot of capabilities that, that are, that are useful. I will say, um, they're, they are useful for this regard, but, but also they're not necessarily geared specifically for civilian protection. They are geared to help mission effectiveness and help you know, enable uh, execution of missions that otherwise we couldn't. So there's still a lot of room in things that, that could potentially strengthen civilian protection that we just haven't tapped into. And you know, Sarah mentioned you know, one of those things is AI and autonomous systems, and there's a lot of fear about those, but we're also looking at ways that we can, can kind of turn it around and actually use advanced emerging technology to better protect civilians. Yeah, and that's a really interesting sort of horizon issue that I would love civil society to get involved in because we are so used to pushing back against things. And there are really scary prospects for AI that certainly we need to push back against. But I think to Larry's point, you know, they can be used for good. And how can we think about flipping the frame so that we're actually using AI and other technologies to protect civilians? But Jake, you know, to your point about future conflicts, we our community has been thinking about this for a long time. Once we get into some sort of near peer conflict, or I don't, I don't even know what we're calling it now, great competition and with China, let's say that we're, let's say that we've got a war between two major powers, the U.S. and China. Um, you know, one thing that Larry, you can tell me if I'm getting this right, but I loved this image of, of. So three columns, you've got civilian protection, you've got, so these are basically three priorities for commanders, civilian protection, force protection, so you don't want your guys and gals getting killed, and then mission effectiveness, you actually do want to accomplish the mission. And the way I think that so many people see those three things are intention. They are, well, if you do civilian protection, then force protection is going to go down, and my mission effectiveness might be it's actually that all three are connected. And if you improve operational effectiveness 
across the board, then you are protecting your forces, you are protecting civilians, and you are accomplishing your mission. So Larry, did I get that right? Yeah, that, that, I think that's a, it's a really important point, right? Because, um, and I actually saw one of the comments was, are we going to address, you know, the, the risk to civilians because ROE can endanger U.S. forces? Um, that is something I hear a lot. I've actually done data analysis on it, and that's, that belief actually doesn't hold out. Um, so there, you know, for example, um, there was one, one case in um, late 2009 where four Marines were killed, um, and they, they were denied uh, air support. Uh, and people said, look, this is McChrystal's restrictive ROE, you know, basically leading to the death of, of US Marines, it was four Marines. Um, and that's what everyone remembers. But they did an investigation and that's actually not what happened at all. It had nothing to do with ROE. It had to do with a, a, an officer in the, in the Tactical Operations Center, basically, um, saying, no, we're not going to send air support here. We're going to send it there because that's what our plan says. Uh, and this is a higher priority mission. And so he basically screwed up, but it had nothing to do with, with ROE. And that's because in McChrystal's work and in all the stuff that we've, that we've done, we've, we've always said, you know, we'll do the best just to protect civilians, but nothing removes the inherent right of self-defense. And so that's how you kind of square that. Right, all the things we're, we're talking about doing, then there is so much that can be done, but that's not supposed to infringe upon the right of self-defense. So, um, so that that's one piece of this. The second piece that we've seen operationally is that when you um, when you kill civilians, it's often because there's a problem in your targeting process, right? So, what what we found operationally, and we actually have data and we have graphs and stuff to show it, is that when you, when, you kill, when you kill fewer civilians, you can actually improve mission effectiveness. So, so, you, so, so we actually have data and I was working with special forces where they have the best data. And we, we saw this, we saw you know, le less, um, less uh, soldiers killed, we saw you know, less civilians killed, and we saw the operation, operational success rate going up. So the, this is a false dilemma or a false trilemma. And so what I want to see is, you know, if you think about all of the different conflicts that the U.S. could get involved in in the future, and you consider that there are probably military planners who have been working on those for a long time. And if you think about, like, there's a shelf in the Pentagon with these binders that say, oh, plan, operational plan for China, operational plan for Russia. I want the Pentagon to go in, take those down, dust them off, and figure out how to get all of these lessons and the civilian population into every page of those operational plans. That's what I think needs to happen. So let me um, let me take us to this question because I do think it's it's in some ways the elephant of, of the public conversation. And three friends have now put it into our chat box. Um, you know, Mark Winning, currently civic, talks about. Um, there's the narrative that the peer-to-peer -peer conflict is, should not be civilian-centered. Um, there's a comment from, you know, Mark Arlasco about um, does the POC lessons that we've learned over 20 years change in a peer-level fight or an Article 5 fight? And then Marla uh, Keenan has asked, you know, we, we talk about the importance of lawyers and the importance of people pushing um, you know, pushing the policy internally in within DOD and within government, but we also have this recently published article that essentially argued that the precision targeting warfare employed for the past 20 years wouldn't suffice in future peer-to-peer -peer conflicts, and in some ways dismissive of humanitarian efforts to reduce civilian casualties arguing that it would undermine our legal maneuvering. And so how do you, how do you tackle those questions about, you know, you, you're talking about pulling it off the shelf and, and, and making it work, but, you know, this is on everyone's minds or on a lot of people's minds. So how do you think about this, this shift in thinking that that's where we're headed and carrying in some of the lessons that have been learned, maybe not as much as they should have been to ensure those future conflicts still have this civilian protection emphasis, um, you know, uh, 
as they get carried out or hopefully not. Sarah, can you mind if I start? No. Okay, so so two things, and I'm gonna flip flip the order. So first of all, um, you know, US, US military lawyers have done incredible things over the last 20 years. I mean, it, you've, you've kind of seen this evolution of thinking and really thinking deeply about some of the protection challenges. I've had, you know, pleasure to work with many of them over the years, just, and really just really great. Um, I also think we've been a little unfair uh, to our lawyers because the lawyers are supposed to be advising. And oftentimes we will put them in a position where they're actually forced to make policy decisions, right? Or, or de facto policy decisions because there's no clear leadership. And so and that, that is something that we should change. You know, we then, and this goes back to, you know, in, in the new administration, we need clear leadership that our, our, our incredibly insightful lawyers can support and inform, but let's not put them in a bad position where they're, they're you know, we advocate these, these policy decisions to, to lawyers, which they're not really supposed to be. So that's the first thing. Second of all, I, I hear this a lot, you know, okay, we have these coin lessons, but what about, you know, great power competition and major war? So from my perspective, I actually started this journey looking at major war, right? Looking at, at, at kind of um, major combat operations back in exercises and evaluations, looking at fratricide, looking at combat ID. And that's where my work started. Uh, and the, these problems that we're talking about um, are there for anything, for, for all these different operations. They go across the board because ultimately the U.S., is not as good as it thinks it is <laughs> with combat identification. And, and it really matters, right? So this is a mission effectiveness view. I think you, know, you can argue that maybe the strategic you know, en environment is gonna be different. I think, okay, that's fair. But ultimately, if the US wants to be as effective as it can, it's, it's gotta figure out these issues <laughs> where, you know, it, it, regardless of if it's urban operations or you know, air defense in a, it, you know, in a austere environment, there's still gonna be these problems, right? So, um, so it, behooves, it behooves it to take these things seriously, regardless of, of the environment. And then civilian casualties provides a kind of a, a window for learning that it can be more effective regardless of how many civilians there are. So I think it's, it's really to the U.S. advantage to say this is a universal problem that we're going to take seriously in, in any kind of environment. Yeah, the way that I hear how Larry talks about this, civilian casualties are actually a canary in a cold mine. I mean, what it tells you is that there is something, if you've got a bunch of civilian casualties, it actually tells you that there is something um, not quite right about your operational effectiveness. And so I think the question is not, does every, you know, does civilian protection get thrown out, thrown out the window when it comes to certain types of conflict, but rather, if you believe that civilian protection helps mission effectiveness which helps you know, force protection, if all three of those things are combined into one thing that is how the US military fights, then it doesn't matter what kind of conflict you go into, all of these things are mutually beneficial. And we shouldn't forget that the US still needs legitimacy to win, not just firepower. And in the age of social media, 24 seven Twitter, you are not gonna get away with causing all of those civilian casualties. You're just not, and you need the credibility and legitimacy in order to you know, actually say mission accomplished. You know, just one more quick comment on, on that latter point. Um, I remember in 2003, uh, it wasn't a civilian casualty event, it was a fratricide event, which, you know, also um, is, is a concern to the U.S. military and actually is really a similar similar um, problem with, with targeting. Um, but that happened. And so there was a big high profile fratricide event. It basically froze the operational chain of command for over 12 hours just a major disruption of, of the operation. You could see today, you know, one civilian uh, casualty incident within a major war could have significant disruption. Um, that that you know, we, we, we like to think, okay, it, it wouldn't, but but we've seen over and over in, in US campaigns that that's, you know, this the political dimension is really important too. So we are, Unfortunately, running a little bit short on time, um, but I also know everyone spends their days on Zoom now. So we try to we try to stay within our 
45 minutes to an hour, but I wanna, I wanna put you both two final questions and I'll ask them one at a time. So Sarah, you talked about legitimacy and we've had a couple of questions. Um, you know, our, our colleague Barrett Alexander asked about, um, you know, the malign actors out there, we're focused on the US, but you look at Syria and, and the Russia's deliberate targeting of healthcare facilities. You look at um, the, the use of um, Russian mercenaries. You look at some of the ways that um, proxies from you know, countries that consider the United States as the adversary carry out their actions. And how are we supposed to, you know, how are we supposed to combat that kind of behavior you know, there's the sense of, well, we fight by the rules and they don't. So one is, you know, the battlefield has evolved pretty negatively um, in, in contexts like Syria and Yemen and elsewhere. And so, you know, I, I wanted to just, if you could just touch on, on that as a challenge we face. Um, and then the last is, you mentioned briefly early on um, the language in the National Defense Authorization Act um, there were some there were some nice pieces in the 2019 that um, you know Dan wrote about um, you know uh, the designation of this person the allocation of funding um, for payments. Um, so uh, the question we have is wh where does Congress fit in and and what's what's the role for Congress to play either in oversight or or legislating or creating authorities. Um, so, you know, one is how do we deal with the fact that our adversaries don't seem to care at all? Um, and the second question is thinking ahead, um, what role should Congress play, could Congress play in improving civilian protection in the U.S. engagements? So over to you. Yeah, anyone interested in what role Congress should play, should I would commend them to Dan Mahanty's pieces um, in Just Security and Elsewhere from, from Civic um, Center for Civilians in Conflict, which does remarkable work on all of these issues. Um, you know, to my mind, actually, the battlefield hasn't changed all that much. I mean, I, I yeah, there's, there's new machinery, there's new weapons, there's modernization, but it's the same, you know, it's the same as thousands of years ago when actually, you know, you can't, it is not just brute force that wins. And, and, and especially in today's world with how, not how the battlefield has changed, but with how technology brings us all together with social media, with all of these other things, I, I would like somebody to prove to me that actually killing more civilians makes you more effective on the battlefield. I just don't think that that is true. And I think, you know, Larry has written a lot about legitimacy and credibility the United States gets that because it follows the rules. Um, and so I, I don't think that this, this argument feels a little bit like gaslighting. It's a little bit like, you know, diverting attention to something that is actually not relevant and that is not provable um, with data. I just don't think that those forces are actually winning. Larry. Yeah, okay. Um, so, so actually, I have a little bit of a different view on that. Um, I do feel like right now, um, you know, Russia has done some terrible, terrible things uh, in, in, in Syria, but not just in Syria, and they get away with it. And, uh, and that's, you know, that's, that's not good for, for a lot of different reasons. So I think, um, you know, we, we've talked today about how the U.S. can do better. Uh, and, you know, I, I was going to say, you um, you know, sometimes you know I've gotten criticized by why why are you why are you so critical right uh, and I I found this this uh, quote from an author uh, Tim Keller and he says love without truth is sentimentality it supports and affirms us but keeps us in denial about our flaws and I think that's what Sarah and I are about today right we are we we care we care about the U S um, but we see denial about our flaws as being something that is uh, that is just not good for us in the long term. So, um, so, so first of all, I think there is there is strategic value in us being as good as we can, both both effective uh, in you know, mission effectiveness, right? But also um, at the same time, you know, kind of you know, doing all three of the things that we talked about. You know, being effective in the mission, pr protecting civilians, and protecting our forces. And those things are not. Um, not contradictory to each other. But we can also, I think, do a much better job in rubbing in the face 
the atrocities and you know, illegal actions that both Russia and non-state armed groups are doing. Um, because honestly, they, they're, they're uh, kind of taking advantage of this asymmetry uh, in, in international law. Um, and, and I think we should, we should, we should be upfront, you know, about, uh, there's a question about IWIPA and, you know, urban warfare and so forth. And I think the U S can have leadership in, in doing that. But I think we also need to highlight that, you know, some of the, some of the risk is because these other groups are, are, are doing things that endanger civilians and there's little cost. So we can do things to increase the cost uh, to them. And I think that's another way of helping to protect civilians, but it also highlights the gulf between, you know, the, the U.S. and what the U.S. can do and what these other groups can do. Um, so I'll just stop there. So thanks. Thanks for, for both of that. I mean, we can leave the question of Congress to like Google Dan Mahanty. Um, and, and he has the answers, but maybe if you want just a last word, um, you know, I really am I'm very grateful for your time and for the work that you've put in today. And so before we wrap up, I just want to give you a chance if there's anything we didn't cover that you think um, would be useful for the audience and then we'll, we'll say goodbye and, and pick us up again in the future. Oh my goodness, there's so, there, oh, we could talk, we could talk for days about this. Um, I, yeah, I mean, I see some of the questions in the question and answer um, are the ones that we've been getting for a long time. And I feel like there's still, you know, we still grapple with these things. Some of them are not easy, um, especially when it comes to future conflict. I would really love to actually um, be in touch with the people who are asking questions so that we can actually engage on these, on the questions that we didn't get to. I would just say, you know, I think all of us are really, we feel like we're on the same team insofar as we all want to improve civilian protection. And so many of the US military service members that I worked with also want to improve civilian protection. You know, we are not at odds here. It's rather a question of figuring out what the solutions are and how we can actually get them to stick. And I think that's what, I think that's why we're all here. Yeah, I, I, I agree. And, um, you know, I, I mean, it would be easy to kind of say, you know, there's low lying fruit, right? Like, um, like, for example, I mean, just so many, right? We could go for hours just on, hey, you know, for, for, the, for the annual civilian uh, casualty reports, could we add numbers of children, right? Because that, that would help in a number of ways in, in just understanding how to provide medical care and, and so forth. So that's like a tiny little thing that's already in the U.S. databases, but it's not in the report, right? And, you know, there's an NDA amendment on, you know, on medical care in conflict, uh, you know, which is, which is a really deep and important issue and less like low-lying fruit that we just haven't made as much progress on. Um, so, I mean, I could go on, on and on about these are all these little things that are possible, but I think ultimately we're hoping that, you know, we can have kind of the the overall leadership say, "Hey, you know, we we're we're gonna we're gonna actually do some bold things, right? We're gonna actually take leadership and, and help um, learn the lessons that we keep on seeing over and over. We're gonna help our allies that are also struggling with this, and we're gonna look at our relationships with our partners and make it a goal for them to be better and not just have a low bar that." You know, we turn things off if they get sufficiently bad that we can't deal with it anymore. And then that helps us with this contrast because we talk about great power competition and, you know, this competition of values. How better to make clear this competition of values than by us doing the best we can and, you know, and then highlighting the, the awful things that are, that are still being done? Well, I, I think that's a really wonderful place for us to finish today. So on, on behalf of our audience, on behalf of myself and the humanitarian agenda, thank you, Sarah Holowinski and, and Larry Lewis for joining us today, for sharing your thoughts, for your work um, up to this point. And um, I would encourage all the people viewing um, to you know, stay engaged with CSAS on this issue and, and with Sarah and Human Rights Watch and Larry and CNA, and we will um, continue to work on this important topic. I wish you all a good afternoon and thank you again for joining us.